Am I talking? Well, then that kind of leads to um, the, the other part of it I want to say, because obviously spending time in, in manufacturing and watching friction being manufactured on all levels, whether it was OE level I've seen in Korea and I've seen many in China being made and, and, and elsewhere, it's, it's really quite remarkable because it's not always about the dust. I hate to say it that way, but it's true. There's a lot that goes on behind it other than a scoop of this and a scoop of that. I've seen it on that level. I've also seen it automated. The fact is, there's more behind it than than just a, a scoop of this and a scoop of that to get to some price point. There's actually the way the pads manufactured, there's the backing plate, the way that it's made. There's a lot of other pieces yes. that can attribute, as I understood it, to that to to some of those issues that we see. Yeah, but even when it comes to formulation, I'll, I'll get to that. But just to answer your question, uh, uh, the way you, you you posed it, yes. So. Um, Everyone's so focused on the friction material, right? Everyone's talking right. about, you know, we have this kind of wear, this type of performance, this sort of, you know, no noise. And, well, the noise thing, a lot of people think it's only coming from the friction material, when in fact, you got to look at the, uh, the friction material as a component of what's going on in the brake pad. Because in the brake pad, you've got very important features. You've got the backing plate, which is extremely important. Um, flatness is a key. People don't tune into that. But one of the most important things is the abutment areas, where everywhere where it makes contact with the caliper. And so there's, there's, there's three basic types of backing plates being used in the aftermarket. Uh, conventionally blanked, which is really, you know, it leaves you with rough, rough edges and sometimes dimensionally incorrect and de dimensionally unstable. Uh, um, that's what we've seen technicians grinding. Yes. Absolutely. I've seen, I've seen yes. that. Yes, so yes. that's very common and I hear that literally every uh, market that we, we go to, right. you know, Dan and I go and talk to all the shops, yeah. and you'd be surprised how many uh, people talk about that. Um, so there's the conventionally blanked, there's the, uh, the shaved backing plates, which basically take that dimension and shave it to make it fit to the exact dimension, and there's fine blanking, which really the OEMs use, and they can use that because there's just, you know, millions of plates being made, so to develop tooling, and amortizing it over millions of units, it's, it's ne the co increase in cost is negligible considering the benefit you get from a, a super precise fit in the caliper. Okay. So that's definitely one major aspect. The other uh, a very important aspect is the uh, shim. That's where and, I was gonna go next. Well, the, the, the thing we see with shims is that, oh, it's got a shim, and people pay no mind to it other than that. And one thing that's really important is making sure that the supplier uh, adheres to at least the general shape of the, uh, the shim that fits to the general shape of the brake pad as it fits in the caliper because you've got contact points in the caliper. So right. in, on the inner, of course, it's only making contact uh, with the piston, so it can be a small shim and that's fine. But on the outer, you know, you need to have a full covered shim because you've got the outer points of a floating caliper usually uh, picking up, pulling that pad back uh, at the extreme ends. Well, you see a lot of shim consolidation out there where they're completely missing, not completely missing, but they're barely touching those extreme ends. So the caliper might be making very little contact um, with the shim. And so you're gonna get an excessive amount of wear there. So the, 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 uh, it may rub off the, the rubber, off the rubber still rubber shim in that contact right. point because there's so much pressure on it. So, you know, out the gate, or I should say out the garage door as the, as the vehicle leaves, it might work great. Um, but over a very short period of time, you're gonna have that rubber potentially coming off. And now it's just, the caliper is exposed to just a steel shim, not a rubber coated steel shim because it wore off. So that can create a noise issue. So you can't really cheat on, you can't cheat on those, on these things. You, you know, if it's supposed to have a certain design, you gotta follow that design. Okay, so if that, if all, using that analogy, then if you look at that, you think about it, um, in certain Asian applications will use like a multi-layer shim, yes. right? And, but yet you're going away from that. That's at the OE level. You don't really That's, see that in the aftermarket. Right, you don't see it in the aftermarket. But again, I have to ask that question because if that car got X amount of miles and worked great, 
then would you not just want to reuse that same stack shim again? Well, I mean, uh, or why is it better? Me, to thirty you? years ago, uh, yes. Right. Uh, when pads didn't have shims on uh, the backing plates. Now every every brake pad comes with shims, and they've got their own design, and they're usually either you know glued on or staked on, and they're not they're not coming off. So in those cases, you cannot reuse those original shims because now you're going to be running into the shim that came but, up. But really the expectation is, hey, if I'm getting this product, um, paid good money for it, I should get something that's working, right? Not something that's consolidated to the point that, okay, yes, there was some cost cutting involved, but it's, it still should work over time like it's supposed to with regular performance levels. Well, I would agree with that. But, but that's, you, not ha that's not what we see that's happening. No, and not only that, but I think for an average consumer or even professional installer or technician, I don't think there, there seems to be confusion on, everybody seems to have an angle on a shim. My shim is this and it's X, however they do it, they sell what they sell. So the reality is, w where should I go? Because I can go with it. Look, everything's relative to cost. That's of a fact. Course, of course. You can change the backing plate, you can change material. We've talked about that, which I agree with. You can you can spec out material, you can change all of these things and get to a price point. It's a fact, the way it is. But mm -hmm. when you look at it, you're looking for all the things we just kind of mentioned plus a shim, but they need to understand there's different levels of shims in there. So maybe you can answer it's, that. It's, it's a almost as much of art as, as it is a science, and there's a lot of trial and error even at the OE level. There really is. I mean, uh, one of my former companies was uh, purchased by an OE company, and I got to dive into the belly of the beast and see how they do things, and it's really just guys trial and error, you know, sitting there hacking away and, and doing things in a lab situation. When it comes to shims, that's, that's really what, that's part of the trial and error. I mean, they'll, they'll use different types. They'll use uh, they'll t try multi-stage shims, which are typically floating. Right. And those, by the way, are the ones that come with the grease packets and the brake pad sets. When people say, hey, my pad set came with grease, you know, why? And it was only to be used in, <clears throat> in that floating shim between. Between. So there's those types. That's a good point. There are the constrained layer type shims, which are where the, the dampening compound is in, the, in between. Yeah. The, the, it's like a sandwich. And then there's the rubber steel rubber uh, types. Uh, they can be somewhat floating, they can be staked on or glued on. Then there's either the constrained layer or rubber steel rubber with, with an adhesive on the, on the exposed side. Because those manufacturer, that particular manufacturer in that particular application wanted the pad to stick to the caliper. Was that mostly to European the piston, applications to the or not? I mean, we found it primarily in Europeans, yes. I don't yeah. know if I've seen it in, in any Asian vehicles, uh, but I have seen it in some domestic vehicles as well. So these are just design philosophies that take place at the OE level, and that's because uh, an engineer in that, in that platform, who was engineering in that platform, went down that rabbit hole and just made that work. I mean, it, from what I've seen, from what I've experienced at, at an OE company, mm. that's how they do it. So um, it's obviously more scientific than that, but at the end of the day, that's kind of what happens. So, so you can't say one's better than the other, you know, because they, at the OE level, they're, all of those work. So really, yeah, that's a good point. one thing, um, you know, one thing that I know that people don't realize, like you had brought up before, is it's not just the friction material. It's, it, you know, the first, the first things that you'll get hit with when we're trying to convince people to try DFC for the first time is, you know, we'll get hit with, uh, does it make noise? How's the dust? But really what, what a lot of these technicians aren't realizing is, like you said, there's so much more to a pad, it's not just the friction material, it's not just whether it makes noise or not, or dust, it has to do a lot with how it's made. You could have the, a perfectly good friction material, but if the backing plate isn't made correctly, um, that can- It doesn't fit right in the caliper. It, it doesn't fit right in the yeah. caliper. It's, it's yeah. gonna and ruin that, the whole brake job, that or the be, shim. That could be right there, your source of the problem. Yeah. You know, but, but let me go one step further. So we're, we talked about all these other components, there's also the attaching hardware in the case of rose clips. Right. You know, the, the metal's got to be the correct uh, spring steel for it to work properly and hold its tension throughout the life of the pad. So that's another critical thing because there's a lot of cheating there. Um, but, but another thing, we touched on this a little bit um, uh, some other time, but um, with the friction material itself, you know, and, and this is something very important to understand, you could have the best formulation uh, available. 
-hmm. And you could have two completely different products with the exact same formulation. But, and, and when you're talking about a ceramic pad, you could have 20 plus different uh, ingredients to mm -hmm. make that product. So forget about even the processing, because that's a whole other art and science. But even if you had two identical formulas, what's more important than that, or let's say just as important as that, is what ingredients are used, like what source of ingredients. So you could have, with the exact same formula, but you buy the ingredients from different suppliers, those pads are gonna completely, act completely different. It could be the difference from, um, you know, if when you look at rotor wear, like if you use really premium ingredients mm -hmm. to make that pad, uh, you're gonna have a product where throughout the life of, the, of, of its, or throughout its life, the rotor will be perfectly clean, you know, there'll be no scoring on it, and uh, a product that will test well mm -hmm. because the formulation is very good. It may test well for the first few thousand miles, but then that's when the scoring starts developing, you know, the, the uh, materials that aren't as high quality, let's say, in the, as they are in this other product will start breaking down and, and noise will start to ensue. So it's like, so, uh, yeah. like making a cake with either butter or margarine. 